Welcome back to the Catholic Economics Podcast. And uh, today I had a request to cover the housing market. And so I thought I would go over a few things on that, uh, some articles that I found and just some basic data and a little bit of uh, some tweets with some interesting data on different components in terms of uh, pricing and that sort of thing. So I'm going to start with an article from the Epic Times. Now, the problem with this is that it's a gated article, and so you may not get access to it, but I guess I'll say that I've been pretty happy with my subscription to their stuff, and I, I always kind of check over it in the morning when I'm looking at emails. And I often find that I enjoy reading their stuff. And, and this article is really good. And it's called, Laden with Debt, Gen Z Faces Daunting Housing Market. And what the article is about, it, it really shows, the thing that struck me the most was the strategies that people are having to put together to try to become homeowners. And I think that's really sad. Uh, to see how ridiculous the strategies have gotten just so that they can get on that first rung. And I think on the one hand, you have people who are older, people who are in the boomer and Gen X generations, and and, and especially when you talk about older boomers, um, they're talking about, well, you know, the way I got into a, a house was I just started working when I was 15. And they save their money. And that's all probably totally valid and true. I know that's I know that's actually true for a lot of boomers that I know. And it's fine for them to say that. And I think that you know you can go to the data and, and look at employment amongst teenagers and you can see that it has dropped off dramatically even in the last, 10 years there's the, the culture has just changed on that front, whether it's people don't want to hire teenagers anymore, or they can't afford to hire teenagers anymore. However you want to say that, or if it's just parents don't want their teenagers working or whether it's something where this, the culture of the teenagers themselves is I'm just going to sit back and not work. And I'm just going to be kind of, I'm not going to push myself in this one area because I know for me and, and I'm, I guess I'm kind of a, an early millennial. I, I was born in 86 for me being in the job, being a job, having a job was partly about family need, honestly. And part of it was just about, as I got a little bit older, it was about independence. So, I mean, I had my first job when I was 13 and I really worked, started working, not not full time, but a uh, but a as much as teenagers work, uh, probably when I was fifteen or sixteen, and th at that point it was about hey you know I got to have a car I got to pay for car insurance which is really expensive when you're <laughs> a male teen, and um, so it was it was about being on my own and being able to go where I wanted to go when I wanted to go, and I just kind of wonder if there's less drive for that in the culture for younger millennials and Gen Z to an extent. And I can't, I can't speak on that super well. I mean, obviously my, my career puts me in conversation with a lot of Gen Z people, but of course they're going to talk to me a little differently than they talk to their peers or their parents or whatever. And so I don't really have a great insight on that. Um, and my own kids are, I would say probably Gen Alpha. My my oldest is uh, maybe Gen Z to some extent, but he's only 13. So this article is interesting to see the strategy. You got people coming together and buying houses with their friends because the only way they can afford it is to have three or four incomes to be able to afford one house. And... I think it's just a really, I mean, obviously a lot of us can see there's problems with the housing market, but this is just a really, um, 
clear picture of how bad things are and how bad things are for the people who you really want to be able to get into the housing market. And so that I think is a good segue into the next thing, which is, okay. So the the idea is that sure for the people who own houses already higher prices, you know, that's a good thing. But if you want someone to be able to get into the housing, you know, get into a house, obviously a lot of increases in housing prices, you know, that's not, uh, that's not a great, that's not a great thing. And so if you, you look at some of the data and so, you know, one, one of the things that people talk about a lot is what's called the Case Shiller, uh, home price index. And the problem with this one is it's, it lags a lot. So right now, the latest data is April of 2024. And you can see in the data, the, this massive run-up starting in the summertime around of, of 2020, but obviously been ramping up since sort of the recovery of you know 2013, 2014 timeframe, have been going up, but really just absolutely skyrocketed. So right now... The index is at 319. In July of 2020, it was at 219. So, uh, you know, not not totally ridiculous to call out a 25% increase or something like that, right? Uh, well, no, 50% increase. So, something like that, where you know, 40, 50% increase in home prices is absolutely ridiculous. Um, and it's obviously driven by a lot of the, um, you know, during the pandemic, you get, you get the money coming in and people get bored and, or, or they just have that cash and they don't need it for anything else. Then they start dumping it into home renovations. And so I think maybe there's some, I guess what you might call fundamentals there, but I think the main, the main component of it is just, we don't have enough housing built, uh, in the sense of housing that is, that makes sense for people when they're starting out. We have a lot of really nice, fancy stuff. So, and I don't have a great proxy for that. So, but here's, here's the way I I think about this in terms of a, a sort of basic financial model. So you've got an asset price and that's a function of, of two things. It's a function of the the stream of value that that thing that that asset generates over time, and it's a function of uh, what we would call a capitalization rate or a discount rate, some some sort of interest rate thing that would discount that stream of values over time back to the present to give you an asset price, right? This is basic financial theory, um, and. If we're getting into other things, well, what about usury and all this? Okay, fine. But I'm just talking about kind of basic financial theory as we have it. So what are some things that have affected that? Well, for one, up until recently, up until uh, 2021, you know, uh, summer, fall, really actually into the winter of 2021, we've had super low interest rates. And, 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 and I'll put a link to this in terms, and I mean low rates in terms of the 30-year fixed mortgage rate. So whatever that stream of value over time is, and I guess the proxy there would be something like rent, you know, how much could you rent that house for? So that would be that first number I was talking about before, that stream of value number. And maybe that's gone up or something like that too. Um, again, where you know, incomes of some people have gone up enough that they're sort of pulling up that value of that house or that house is worth more. It would rent for more because you added something to it, because you renovated something. The other thing is rates have been really low until they start moving up. And now they're averaging near seven. They were at two or three. So maybe a little bit above three, but two or three percent for a 30 year fixed mortgage rate. Now they're at six or seven, six and a half or seven. And so then the question is, okay, well, if 
if what we would normally think is that the asset price is a function of the stream of value over time, and okay, maybe that's gone up a little bit, so that would push up the asset price. Well, what about the rate? What about the capitalization rate? Well, if that capitalization rate has gone up, that's supposed to push down the price of the asset. You were more heavily discounting that stream of value from that thing over time. And if we're more heavily discounting that with those higher rates, then that would tend to put downward pressure on the price. Now, here's the problem is that all of this stuff happens over time. And there's a period of time in any kind of adjustment for an asset where if the rates go up, if if interest rates are going up, that capitalization rate's going up, the asset price is not necessarily just going to fall in lockstep with that increase in the rate. And the reason for that is because sometimes there's just not a lot of turnover in that asset. There's not people trading, transacting that asset. Now, in the stock market, you wouldn't see that. In the stock market, if there was some effect of interest rates going up and that negatively affecting people's valuations of assets, you would see that get priced in very, very, very quickly. And so, and and the reason for that is because there's so many transactions every second in the stock market. But in housing, it's not. Selling your house and buying another one, unless it's for some kind of um, investment property, and I, and you know, I think undergirding all of this, you could talk about investment, you know, big investment firms buying up houses like mad, and that pushing up the asset price too. But I'm talking about just your average person. Okay, well, if interest rates have gone up since I bought my house. That's going to make me less likely to want to move. Now, why? Well, because if I sell my house that I'm in now and I got to go buy another house, well, then I'm basically trading, let's say, you know, two and a half or three percent mortgage rate for a six and a half or seven percent mortgage rate. And that's going to massively impact the payment that I'm going to be making every month. I might be making a fifteen hundred dollar month payment now. I might be I might be making a, a twenty five hundred thirty three thousand dollar a month payment when I when I change this up. You know, depending on the house I buy and all of that. So I'm less likely to want to sell this house. So even with rates going up, we're going to see a fall off in transactions. And in fact, actually, um, that's uh, that's what we've seen. And I'm going to put a little chart here from a from a Twitter account that that um, that really follows the, the the markets really well in terms of housing, and the this tweet that I'm going to put up for you, uh, it's it shows housing inventory in in a couple different markets, and you can see over time just the 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 number of houses on the market, right? So that's what they're talking about as far as inventory goes. Has, you know, was falling and falling really fast, especially after 2020. It was falling before that, but it was falling. It fell really fast after 2020, and especially, you know, it's, it continues to fall after 2021. As I, like I said, those rates go up, people are less likely to want to go and, and get another house because they don't want to have to get a different mortgage. And so that was generally true in the Northeast, but then what happens here in this chart that's interesting is you got Texas and Florida all of a sudden going up and all of these houses on the market. Now, I don't know if that's, I mean, this just says active listings by region. So I don't know if that's because you have a big building boom in those states, you know, with, you know, the story that you hear is, oh, there's people moving from California and Illinois and all these other blue states or whatever to places like Texas and Florida. So maybe that's part of the reason why you got a bunch of listings there. But either way, there's a lot of that stuff on the market. And so the way to think about this is that, okay, if we start to see more inventory, then potentially those higher interest rates are going to all of a sudden be brought to bear on the price of that asset now. So in the Northeast, where we still have low active listing counts, those prices aren't going to move. It's going to be hard to see those prices move. But in 
like I said, on this one chart here, Texas and Florida, all of a sudden that inventory is going up. That's going to signal that we're going to have people uh, uh, transacting. And those high, those high rates are going to tend to put downward pressure um, on prices. Now, I want to sort of attenuate this. I've got another tweet from uh, Wolf Richter talking about um, the, the purchase mortgage applications index. And that's still being, on a nationwide basis, very, 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 very low. And so they're just in general, right? So maybe Texas and Florida are a different story lately but in in the big picture there's this is showing there's not a lot of people wanting to get mortgages it's still very low and so again it points to this picture of these high rates are making it hard for people to make make a choice uh going back to another of nick Gurley's tweets uh tweets excuse me uh he starts talking about price cuts so price cuts have have trended up since last year and so the idea there is okay well if we're starting to see price cuts happen in other words people you know you list your house and you're waiting for someone to come and be interested and buy but it's not happening it's not happening and so you start cutting prices so this idea of you know how many listings on the market have a price cut on them that number is going to be relevant to where we think prices are going to be going in the future. So if we're thinking that prices are going to start to fall a little bit, it's that should be an indicator that, well, sorry, a, a, a bigger rate of price cuts should be an indicator of that. And what this chart shows is that we're at the highest level of price cuts in June relative to any year in the past most recently up until 2018. So we're at 24.3% of the listings have price cuts right now uh, in June of 2024 versus June of 2018, it was 25.4. And every year between then, we had fewer price cuts. And so that has contributed to this increase in prices. And so here's, here's kind of another wrinkle to think about. Okay, so just to recap, we've got very high prices. We've got 40% increase since 2020. And along with that, we've got super high rates. And so anybody wanting to get into the housing market right now is going to have an astronomically high payment. And so they're not able to get in. And what that also means is that people who currently own houses are not willing to sell them because they don't want to get out of the mortgage they're in that might have a low rate and then go buy another house and that house have another mortgage that's got a much higher rate. So with all of that, another issue is that once we start to see prices fall, then the Fed, who is the one who manipulates interest rates to try to uh, help the economy out with, uh, you know, this is their policy, right? Uh, monetary policy where do they have to go because obviously the high prices are a mixed bag they're very unpopular they make the current administration very unpopular with younger people who are trying to get a house but they make it very popular for people who are very much enjoying the fact that they bought at 150 and now their house is worth 300. So it's a bit of a mixed bag there, but these, I, I think what's going to happen, what you're going to see happen is these high rates are eventually going to break the housing market to some extent. We're going to start seeing the actual prices falling on average across the country. And when you start to see that again, it changes that political calculus and I think it's also the confusion of the Fed that you know, there really isn't a lot of reason in the official data for them to cut rates to try to boost the economy because most of the main numbers that they look at are all things are fine. Obviously, for the average person, that's not necessarily the case. And, and I'm big on the camp that economics is supposed to be studying people, not the other way around. And so if 
the economics profession says everything's great and the average person says, no, not really, well, then the average person's right. So this is a pickle for the policy regime. And I think these, these are interesting things to look at as far as housing goes. I don't exactly know where it's going, how long prices will hold out. I think if you're looking at the price cut data, I think that's probably the biggest sign that we're going to see prices falling. How much they're going to fall, I don't know. But I think that's you're starting to see the effect of those high rates and potentially, potentially that you might get some opportunities for younger millennials and Gen Z to start to be able to get a foothold if if these rates stay high long enough to really push prices back out of the absurd stratosphere that they're in. Okay, so last time I talked, I've, I've been talking about GDP now every time here, and I'm going to continue to do that because I think it's a great uh, barometer for where things are at. And I was corrected, and I appreciate the correction. I, I got an email, um, a, a macro economist said, hey, look, you got it wrong with GDP now. GDP now isn't year-over-year year growth. It's quarterly growth on an annual basis. So they try to forecast the growth from one quarter to the next, and then the number that they spit out is here's you know here's here's the annual version of that. So if if the economy continued to grow for four con, four consecutive quarters the way it's growing right now, then we would expect to see in, in the case of GDP now right now two percent growth. So we're at two percent as of the July tenth estimate. We'll get another estimate on Tuesday the sixteenth. So for the next episode, I'll have a different. Uh, projections. So what's happened is recently in the last couple of up updates to this, the forecast for second quarter GDP growth is now up at 2%. It was down um, as low as I think 1.5. And it's kind of interesting to see that the what they call the blue chip consensus, in other words, uh, another forecast of this uh, is slightly lower than that. It looks like it's about 1.8. And so the uh, I think the, the bigger interesting story is that since April, this thing has done pretty much nothing but go down, with a couple of exceptions. And we're much lower now at 2 than we started with the forecast for the second quarter, which was above 4 uh, early on in May. And we hung out in the, in the 3 range for a little while, and now... We're at two. And I think you could probably tell a story where official inflation is understated such that if this turns out to be right, we're probably in a recession in terms of actual inflation. You know, I was just talking about house housing prices going up 40% in the last three years. Um, that's pretty tremendous. And uh, that's a lot more than kind of the, the overall inflation rate. So I don't know where we're going to have the second quarter of GDP, but it's interesting to see this, this uh, number kind of get more pessimistic over time, at least in general. And the last thing I want to put up is a Financial Times article. And here's the title, Proxy Season Results Show Support for ESG Efforts Continues to Ebb. So ESG is environment, uh, <clears throat> social, and governance. And so these are your environmental initiatives. Like, hey, you know, we've got to reduce our blah, blah, blah emissions or whatever. The social aspect. So we've got to have diversity initiatives and this sort of thing. And then governance. So, you know, what are your stakeholders for your firm? We shouldn't just care about uh, shareholders and that sort of thing. Um and so the article is really interesting. It kind of goes through uh, this, what we call proxy season. So in other words, a time when uh, a lot of uh, uh, publicly traded firms are, be ma are making decisions. And, and so the, the people who have significant shares in that company are going to be voting on what, what that company's goals and, and things like that should be. Uh, 
<laughs> says this year, only two climate related sharehold shareholder proposals received majority support at Russell 3000 companies. So Russell 3000 is an index in you know, all these publicly traded companies, uh, 3000 of them, apparently both proposals pushed companies to publish more information about their efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So two out of, out of, you know, probably thousands, <laughs> Only two of them receive support. And this was only about publishing information about efforts. So you have this scare tactic amongst the lefty environmentalist types that they don't like what do they call green hushing, where where companies start to peel back a little bit about their kind of screaming and yelling about how wonderfully environmental they are because Customers and shareholders just don't care. And sometimes it targets them for in, in a negative sense. Uh, it goes on, no shareholder proposals related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So this would be the, the social part. Have broken above 50% support this year. Wow. That is uh, pretty wild. Says uh, this drop, the drop in support highlights a mean reversion of sorts for BlackRock, Vanguard, and other big asset managers. Um, so it's just kind of interesting to see that the ESG backlash that started, I think, a couple years ago, really, has just lost a ton of support. Uh, companies are just, and obviously, a lot of it's purposeful. You've got, you've got state treasurers or, or state attorney generals or whatever, uh, putting pressure and saying, Hey, look, we're not going to invest our pension funds with BlackRock. If BlackRock is pushing all this ESG stuff and you're talking tens of billions of dollars. And so that kind of freaks out some of these people, uh, some of these big companies, some of these big investment firms. And so they start backing off of this stuff. Um, so I, I think this is interesting stuff. I think it's in general good, uh, in the sense that, first of all, I'm kind of just not really sure why this whole stakeholder model is super important. And you know, maybe I'm wrong about that. But the other thing is just that I don't trust the people setting the goals for these things. Even if I'm okay with the stakeholder model, I'm not I'm not confident that the people who are deciding who the stakeholders are and how we should respond to them uh, is in the best interest of the, the average person. I think it's in service to bizarre uh, pagan ideologies and uh, weird uh, notions about how humans ought to interact with the world around us and how we ought to interact with each other. So, I, I don't, uh, I don't see the need for ESG. I think it's, I think if you're going to do a stakeholder thing, you got to get a better religion than ESG. It's just the wrong religion. And with that, I, I'm going to stop for today. If you have questions or if you have ideas or anything like that, uh, put them in the comments. If you're on YouTube, uh, send me an email, L Russell. That's two S's and two L's at leoinstitute.org. If you want to contact me about something, if you have a correction, uh, happy to receive those. <laughs> uh, or if you just have questions or suggestions for other episodes. So this one was kind of a, a requested episode. If you have other ideas for stuff, happy to uh, entertain that. Thanks for listening and I'll see you next week.